So hello, everyone. Great to see you here today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Anherid Lang. I'm the executive director of PHAP. That's short for the International Association of Professionals in Humanitarian Assistance and Protection. It's really terrific to see so many familiar names of people joining, introducing themselves in the chat. Also quite a few new people. So a big welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time. As you know, uh, today's webinar is entitled Access and Humanitarian Protection, Lessons from Restricted Operational Contexts and Their Application to the COVID-19 Operational Environment. This is the first webinar in a series organized by NRC, the Global Protection Cluster, and PHAP with financial support from USAID. This is clearly a topic that's engaging a lot of people. Uh, again, it's great to see so many of you in the, the virtual room here on Adobe Connect. I know we also have a couple of hundred people um, following the live stream and, and more coming in every moment. A warm welcome to all of you. And so with that, we'll turn to today's event. As mentioned, this is the first webinar in a series of four in which we will be looking at how humanitarian protect, protection relates to access. Humanitarian protection is often the most needed in the very conflict zones where access is also the most restricted. In these contexts, humanitarians carrying out protection work and advocacy are likely to face actors trying to restrict their access and ability to operate or simply to keep them out entirely. In addition, both in conflict zones and in contexts where access was previously relatively unrestricted, the COVID-19 pandemic has led to sudden changes in how protection actors can access populations of concern. What can we learn from the experience of protection actors operating in hard to reach areas that we can apply now to the new challenges of the current operational environment? Today in this first session, we will be looking at some of the key terms, concepts, interlinkages, and dilemmas of protection and access in armed conflict, disaster, and health emergencies. This will be an initial exploratory session, and then we'll then be approaching this topic more in depth from different angles in the future events of this series. We've already received a number of questions from participants, and we will be covering a lot of these integrated into the discussion today with our panelists. We may also have a few minutes uh, at the end for a dedicated Q&A session, and I do encourage you to engage in the discussion throughout the event in the chat, and also to submit any additional questions that come to your mind as the panelists are speaking, to submit those throughout the event. We will be covering as as many as possible during the session today and for any that we don't have time for in the live event we will either address them in one of the upcoming events in the same series or we will follow up with our speakers afterwards to see if they would be willing to provide an answer in writing that we can then include in community discussions following on today's event. So, um, very pleased to introduce our panel. Now, we're joined today by a panel of practitioners who have dealt with questions related to protection and access in different contexts and from different organizational perspectives in their work. First of all, very happy to have with us Pilar Jimeno Sarciada, head of the Protection of Civilian, Pop of Civilian Population Unit at the ICRC. Welcome to you, Pilar. Great to have you on the line. Hello, thank you very much for having me. Uh, good afternoon. Great. Th thanks for being here, Pilar. Um, and joining us from Tunis, Yasin Abbas is the recently appointed protection cluster coordinator for the whole of Syria. His recent experience also includes protection in remote management situations in Syria and the surrounding countries, as well as in Libya. Welcome to you, Yasin. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me uh, with you. Our pleasure. And joining us from Athens, where he is currently the Deputy Representative for UNHCR, we have Jason Hepps. 
Apart from sharing his perspectives from the current response in Greece, Jason also has extensive experience from the field and HQ, including four years working on the Syria response. Welcome, Jason. Hi, thank you for having me. Great, thanks a lot. And coming at this with more of a focus on the access side, we have Maria Duncan joining us from Yemen. Maria works as a humanitarian access advisor with NRC and is the co-chair of the Humanitarian Access Working Group in Yemen. Welcome, Maria. Thanks for being on the line. Thanks very much for having me. And bringing a global perspective on access, joining us from New York is Sophie Solomon, Global Access Advisor with OCHA, who is supporting operations worldwide on access negotiations and strategy. Welcome, Sophie, and good morning to you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and looking forward to this conversation. Terrific. Thanks so much. And I'd also like to mention we'll be hearing from William Shimali, Global Protection Cluster Coordinator, at the end of the session for some wrap-up reflections on today's discussion. Great to have William with us as well. Um, perfect. Okay, great. So um, we have we we have a broad audience with us uh, for today's session. I see it's growing all the time as well. We have more people still coming into the room. Um, we wanted to start out with uh, trying to make sure that we're all on the same page about some of the key terms and concepts that we're dealing with here. So first, I would like to turn to you, Pilar, for one of the most fundamental concepts uh, for our discussion, but one that can be a bit confusing sometimes could we just start with the question, what is protection as the term is used in humanitarian response? And I know this can be a very long discussion, but we're going to try to move quickly uh, here through through the, uh, the key terms and concepts. But uh, very grateful, Pilar, if you could help us out with an overall uh, definition, uh, perhaps a couple of examples uh, to help us get started. So term, the term protection, over to you, Pilar. So the most common definition of protection, I would say, is the one that um, that has been adopted by the YAS, and that refers to all activities that aim at obtaining the full respect for the rights of the individuals in accordance with the relevant bodies of the law, those uh, being um, human rights law, international humanitarian law, and refugee law mainly. In practical terms, protection aims to ensure that authorities and other actors non-state arm access mainly, fulfill their obligations and uphold the rights of individuals in order to preserve life, security, dignity, and well-being of uh, victims of armed conflicts and other situations of violence. So the idea is that protection tries to prevent or put an end to actual or potential violations of the law. Protection focuses on understanding causes and circumstances of violation and addressing those responsible and those who can influence them and second, on dealing with the consequences of violations. The protection response can also focus on reinforcing the capacity of individuals and communities to respond to risk and threat. An effective protection response uh, must be informed first by analysis of the threats and risks that people face, and steps have to be taken to minimize those threats and risks to ensure the respect rights of all people. That means that uh, organizations should be shouldering the primary responsibility for people. This responsibility based on state and non-state groups, humanitarian actors should identify the, the potential risk and threats and should highlight the proper responsibilities while supporting such protection strategies of individual rights. So this, in, in essence, is the understanding of humanitarian protection by main uh, humanitarian organizations doing protection today. Excellent. Thank, thank you for that. And, and staying with you, Pilar, and thank you for, for uh, staying as close to the mic as you 
possibly can. I know it's tricky. Uh, what about some of the main terms that we often hear related to protection? So uh, protection activities or protection programming, protection mainstreaming, protection of civilians. Do these all refer to the same thing or are there important differences that uh, everyone should be aware of? Back to you, Pilar. So within the Red Cross and Red Cross of Movement, we, we have worked uh, with three different levels of, or, or types of protective, uh, protective action. Sorry. So the first level will be what we call protection mainstreaming, which refers to ensuring that protection risks are minimized and potential violations of uh, international and domestic law taken into consideration when carrying out all humanitarian activities. So this means that assistance activities also address protection needs through ensuring that dignity, access, participation, and safety for affected people is taken into account. And this is relevant for all humanitarian actors, whether they are protection actors or, or not. So what we consider uh, protection mainstreaming is that at a minimum, humanitarian actors should ensure that they do no harm and adopt a protection lens in all of their humanitarian response. A second level will be a specialized protection activities addressing the causes and circumstances leading to violations of the law. Uh, it also includes addressing the consequences of these violations, that I, as I said before. These activities may include the people the of their liberty, uh, activities aimed at restoring family links, efforts to clarify the fate of the missing, other specific areas of protection activities also such child protection, addressing sexual and gender-based violence, mind risk education, or the provision of legal assistance. So a specialized protection approach entails regular monitoring of situations of persons supported, a confidential dialogue, including reporting to authorities and relevant non-state actors at different levels. Obviously, uh, on the confidential dialogue, this is a very much ICRC approach. Um, requires alleged violations of uh, relevant bodies of, of the law and other norms. Uh, and then the third level, will, which will be uh, the, all the efforts that start to promote uh, an enabling environment that is conducive to the protection of vulnerable people by, by advocating that humanitarian principles and protection elements are taken into account, and these elements are integrated into state policies, practice, and legislation. So that will be more or less the differences between the different types of uh, definitions or notions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Pilar. Um, I'm quite, I'd like to move on um, now to Yassine to ask one more fundamental question about protection before we move on. When talking about protection, we often talk about the rights of people. And those who uh, and those responsible for ensuring those rights are, are normally states, of course, as uh, as Pilar mentioned. We also talk about the obligation of states and other parties to conflict uh, to follow the laws of armed conflict. Given that states and uh, also to some extent uh, armed uh, non-state actors or armed groups um, are holding these obligations, uh, what then is the role of humanitarian organizations to carry out protection work? How do you see this, Yassine, as protection cluster coordinator? Uh, you are part of coordinating the response of a range of different actors relating to protection. So what is your perspective on this and what does humanitarian protection mean in the Syrian context? Over to you, Yassine. Okay, I'm afraid we, we've lost the connection with Yassine. We're going to try to get that back. In the meantime, uh, Jason, if I could um, turn to you. Um, so a variation on the same question. Uh, so looking at the context of the Greek islands, what is humanitarian protection in this context? And how does it manifest itself differently uh, from uh, that in the Syria response? Uh, if, if you could come in on that, Jason. Sure, thank you. You can hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, great. Um, I mean, it's quite different. Uh, there are a lot of the same principles between the Greece experience and then the Syria response uh, situation. I mean, and if, I'm, if we're just focusing on the uh, Syria as a country, so the, the, it being a conflict 
zone versus Greece uh, being receiving uh, refugees, asylum seekers, and persons uh, traveling through. The other um, point in, in Greece being uh, having relatively strong state uh, standards and uh, EU directives which apply to those that are arriving. Um, the humanitarian protection, uh, one element of it that we are doing, and it's on the islands and the mainland, but uh, it's quite acute in the islands, is, you know, one level would be uh, monitoring the compliance uh, to those, and another level would uh, be uh, the areas where we are actually doing interventions similar to those that you would see in states uh, where you are coming from. Some of those similar may be in, in, in Syria and in working with and identifying uh, unaccompanied children, having programs to support and refer uh, victims of gender-based uh, and survivors of gender-based violence, making sure within these programs of, that, have, that derive out of these strong um, EU directives, which are, provide for very, quite relatively generous accommodation in, in compared to in conflict zones, accommodation and support for essential items for all of the population, but then finding and making sure that those within, with specific needs within that population, the elderly um, or, or others that are in at-risk groups, do receive uh, specific support, identifying them, and then making sure it's tailored to their needs. Over. Got it. Thank you. Um, and then turning to the other term in this session's title, access. This seems like a very straightforward concept, but what is it in practice that we need access to? Maria, could I ask you to come in on this? Sure. Thanks very much. Um, straightforward. <laughs> That's quite interesting. I guess uh, the breadth of it makes it straightforward because we get to consider everything access and interfere in everyone's work. But in short, NRC defines humanitarian access as the ability of crisis-affected populations to access impartial assistance and protection. Um, and what's really important to note is that there's, we, we see three pillars to this. The first is our, as NRC's, ability to access people with quality assistance, uh, people's ability to access our services, and then people's ability to access assistance and protection provided by other actors. Um, and I think it's really important to emphasize the, those last two because we often think of access or, or what define access when it's a challenge or when it's an obstacle. Um, and we don't always think about um, improving it when we don't really, really know when we could lose it. Um, key words to, to, to also emphasize is safe and sustainable access and inclusive and equitable access. And that really can be summed up as the quality of your access. We can have compromised access, um, but the quality of the access is really important to make sure that it really is unimpeded access with quality services. And that's where you know the link to humanitarian principles comes in because they're so crucial to maintaining quality access beyond just ensuring operational independence. Um, so I think that's how I would sum it up. Perfect. Thanks so much, Maria. And now turning to Sophie, uh, as we are normally concerned about access being limited or restricted, uh, what are some of the main reasons uh, for those restrictions? If you could uh, just briefly outline some of the key access challenges that we see uh, around the world. Over to you, Sophie. Perhaps we can wait yes, a moment sure. for the Skype. OK, no, there, there we go. Uh, go right ahead. Okay, no, so like, first of all, if we're looking at the access constraint that we're observing worldwide, I mean, they are more or less uh, the same, even if, of course, they are very contextualized. But if we are looking at the main categories, we see like conflict, violence against humanitarian personnel and assets, and the misappropriation of aid, interference, bureaucratic impediment, more and more, are the main like access constraint that we're observing in the countries where we have humanitarian action. And what we're really like looking at is uh, the, the patterns and like what are the challenges in terms of this access constraint. And what we see is that the current armed conflicts that are really characterized by a multiplication and a fragmentation of actors 
present particular difficulties in obtaining access for humanitarian assistance because we have to negotiate access with so many different actors. It's very time consuming for uh, humanitarian actors and requires like an in-depth knowledge of the community, of the different actors, and a constant endeavor to like negotiate access and explain like who we are as humanitarian actors. What we see also at global level is that access discussions are increasingly politicized and we see that access is discussed at the Security Council and we see like contexts such as like Syria, Myanmar, Venezuela, where humanitarian access is extremely politicized, which actually in the field like trigger like some uh, difficulties in terms of sort of negotiating access. If we're also looking at some counterterrorism policies and uh, some policies that actually criminalize humanitarian assistance or criminalize medical care, it's an additional challenge uh, to humanitarian actors on the ground. So different levels of constraints, uh, some that are very localized and also some that are like really like triggered by the general discussion and the global context. Great, thanks so much. Uh um, Sophie, we have a question that's just come in in the chat. Um, perhaps we can take a moment, uh, staying with you, to just address this right off the bat. So the question's from Marianne uh, in Sweden. She writes, I have formerly worked on uh, for, uh, formerly worked on Yemen and humanitarian access. It was a challenge, to say the least. What can practically done practically be done to prevent uh, COVID-19 from being used as a way to impose restrictions on humanitarian work? I know this is a big question, but also a very, very timely one. And I wonder uh, from where you're sitting, Sophie, uh, what are some of the discussions um, uh, that you're aware of when it comes to this question, which I'm sure must be on the front of many people's minds and also in other locations around the world? Over to you, Sophie. No, thank you for this question, and I think it's one of our main concerns. We are a bit worried that COVID-19 would be used by certain parties as like an excuse to like restrain access even more. And I'm sure like Maria could uh, actually like explain even a bit more like what's happening on the ground. What we're really like trying to make sure is that uh, when we're negotiating access, we are making sure that everything that we're doing right now will not have like an impact on the long term. So while we are negotiating access for COVID-19, while like taking into account all the public health measures that have been put in place by the authorities, we are making sure that the, the negotiation we are doing and the, uh, the measures that are put in place by the authorities will not undermine on the short, middle and long term our capacity to have access in to, to the communities in the future. And I think we can discuss like uh, a bit longer when we will like go into like the COVID-19 uh, topic. But indeed, we are a bit worried about some of the restriction that restrict some sectors of implementing their activities or having access to certain categories of people or having access to certain areas of the country. We are a bit worried about the additional measures that have been put in place by authorities to control movement. At the same time, we need to balance that with the necessity of respecting the public health measure. So it's a very challenging uh, balance that we have to make between like understanding the public health measure, measures and at the same time like making sure that any like decision that will have any like agreement will have with the authorities will not undermine our capacity to have access in the middle and long term. Excellent. Thanks so much, Sophie. And yes, indeed, I'd like to jump back to Maria now, um, reflecting on now what we've heard from Sophie, uh, primarily from a, a global perspective. Um, how does this relate, Maria, to the kinds of access constraints that you're seeing in Yemen? Over to you, Maria. Thanks very much. Yeah, I mean, I think Sophie really, really set the set the scene. I mean, in Yemen, for those of you who work here or have worked here, know that we have the plethora of access constraints. I mean, if you kind of box it into bureaucratic and security and logistical constraints, we have it all. And we often hear about the bureaucratic constraints, um, particularly in the north of Yemen, being kind of the predominant notion around what access looks like here. But really, they're so overlaid and they're throughout the country. So, you know, we have multiple layers of approvals at every stage of program implementation. Um, and they are ad hoc, they're unpredictable, they're often contradictory at the national and the governorate levels. Um, they are often used as a tool to extract more from humanitarian actors at each stage. So that's where our independence is affected, which then, of course, affects 
our ability to be impartial or our, our ability to be neutral. Um, but then that overlays with security. I mean, sometimes bureaucratic approvals are related to security and maybe that there are legitimate uh, security concerns for a travel permit being denied, for example, to show you the overlay. And then, of course, logistical, you know, we have um, floods and, uh, you know, mountainous roads and things like that to also think about for, for reaching populations and them to reach us. And for every, in a context like Yemen, for every decision we make to, to reach a population, um, there will be some level of compromise because it is not unimpeded access here and it will affect the quality. So is it because, will we be sacrificing a little bit of our neutrality and can we mitigate that risk? Will we be sacrificing, um, you know, perfect protection mainstreaming um, principles for beneficiaries to reach a distribution point, but it's either that or, or there's no service at all. So it's always weighing up um, what can we mitigate in terms of that the compromises we're making um, to fulfill our humanitarian imperative, but also knowing when to step back. Um, many of you probably know Yemen is quite um, in the news at the moment, as Sophie pointed out, politicised um, with US, uh, the US pulling funding, often being part of Security Council statements, and so it is a very difficult area to know when to when to say no and when to say that it's too compromised to hold back the short-term access for longer, to maintain opportunities for longer-term sustainable access and community acceptance that we hope we will reach through a maybe a protracted negotiation process. Um, so we really have everything here in Yemen. Great, thank you so much. Um, Maria, there, you already discussed a bit, I think, these concepts, but I want to just very quickly zero in on the specific terms that I think we'll continue to hear throughout the session, um, hard to reach areas and restricted operational contexts. Could you help us uh, just by briefly uh, explaining what these terms normally refer to? Back to you. Yeah, of course. So hard to reach for us is about thinking about the context in which we work. So access is the, is the tools, the strategies, and the approaches we use to get to the hardest to reach populations. Um, what is important to remember again is that I think we often measure or define or default to think about hard to reach as a geographical um, space, but we really have to think about hard to reach populations that may be you know, throughout the country, it might be a particular ethnicity, a particular demographic that are also hard to reach because of the constraints to, to get services that they face. So that's one really important point. And then another thing is that hard to reach is, is measured in, in nine categories that Sophie also alluded to before, um, because we have to measure it somehow. It's not a perfect evidence base, but, and, Two of those categories are about obstruction of aid and denial of assistance, which are much harder to quantify and much harder to identify with staff as opposed to contamination or violence against humanitarian personnel. So it's always much harder to, um, to measure and therefore respond to what I mentioned in the first place, that second access pillar of beneficiaries getting to our services. Um, but, so that's hard to reach. And then you had another one? Uh -huh. Yes, uh, re restricted operational contexts. Right. So I guess, I mean, technically you could think about this across all of the bureaucratic, logistical and security constraints, but for Yemen I think it's really about focusing on the regulatory environment that we work in, which I also mentioned before. So the bureaucratic and the interference, the layers of approval, how they're all tied to each other. Um, in Yemen it's very hard to predict these, it's very hard to put systems in place, um, it's a bit of a divide and conquer, we, as INGOs and NGOs more generally, it's hard to come up with common positions and patterns because there is nothing in place to, to follow, no kind of So I think that that regulatory environment is really what is, um, about Yemen is what we would consider our restricted operational context, but of course security and logistical constraints also um, fall into that. And one thing I would like to highlight also about that is that we don't want to automatically comply with every directive and every ad hoc or, you know, district level directive that comes through, but we also have to balance that with 
staff safety if we don't comply, um, and organisational reputation if we don't comply. So always things we have to think about when we have authorities, um, uh, yeah, pack, putting us in a in a tough position where we have to weigh that up. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Maria, and uh, we'll be looking forward to coming back to you to, to speak more, um, more about the current situation where you are in Yemen. Um, now at this point, uh, as in this event series, we're interested in the interlinkage between access and protection. I would like to look next at, at how access and protection relate to each other. As we discussed earlier, protection is often about rights of individuals and duties of states and other authorities. In terms of access, it's also often states or armed groups that are responsible for putting restrictions on humanitarians' ability to reach affected communities. Pilar, if I could come back to you, uh, do you have any general reflections um, that you could add to, 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 what, uh, to what you shared earlier regarding this connection, this interlinkage between protection and access? Over to you, Pilar. Uh, it's critical to be able to monitor the protection situation, assess victims' needs independently, work with communities, address consequences in an impartial manner. In situations of armed conflict, access to victims is regulated by IHL. So rules of IHL regulating humanitarian access must be respected by all parties to armed conflict. Each party bears a primary responsibility to meet the needs of the population under its control. So impartial humanitarian organizations could have the right to offer their services in order to carry out humanitarian activities, especially in situations where those needs of the populations are not being met. Um, but these humanitarian activities are, and, and the consent of, uh, so the, the access to, to uh, people in need is um, subject to consent to the, <clears throat> of the parties to the conflict. And I tell the parties to the conflict have to provide this specific concern when this control, uh, when these needs are not being met, as I said. Um, IHL does not specify, however, what it means to humanitarian activities uh, that organizations may offer. So the Geneva Convention, Conventions applicable to international armed conflict specified that the ICRC and other, and other impartial humanitarian organizations and offer to undertake humanitarian activities for the protection and the relief of those affected by armed conflicts, so their protection activities are included. From an Article 3 of the Geneva Convention only refers to services, but one should consider that the right of initiative that is applicable in, in NIAC also includes all humanitarian activities, including protection. So, in, in some humanitarian activities that can be offered within IHL have both a protection and assistance I mentioned, since both work towards the same objective, which is uh, safeguarding the life and dignity of the victims of armed conflict. And this is how we should be reading um, any uh, negotiation for access and uh, protection activities when we have access constraints. Extremely helpful, Pilar. Thank you for that. And I, we did have a few questions regarding the legal framework that had come up. So I'm, I'm very glad that that you were able to um, to also help us by by bringing in uh, how how IHL helps us to understand that relationship between protection and access. Um, Staying with you now, Pilar, if we turn now to how humanitarians, how humanitarian actors link up these two concepts in practice and how it might differ uh, from one humanitarian actor to another, one way to approach this is to look at organizational structure. We thought it would be interesting um, uh, considering that we have a panel with people coming from several different organizations who all have either protection or access in their job titles. So Pilar, if I could start with you, again, you're the head of the Protection of Civilians unit with ICRC. Do you have a comparable access unit in the organization or how is that structured? within the ICRC uh, between work on access, work on protection, and, and why? Over to you, Pilar. So, so, no, at the ICRC, we do not have an independent access unit. Responsibilities for negotiating access are spread across the organization, obviously, uh, under the strategic direction of the head of each field delegation for every specific context. 
So at the level of protection, um, for instance, detention delegates will be negotiating access to places of detention and specific groups of detainees. Field delegates will maintain a dialogue with state and non-state and groups to be able to seek or maintain access to populations in need in their specific geographic area responsibility. And of course, uh, the head of delegations will discuss at the highest level both geographic as well as sexual access to the whole country. Um, so why is that? Uh, that why we do we have this approach to, to, uh, to access? Well, I think this approach is a reflection of the field realities uh, and experience of the ITRC. In many contexts, you don't have a centralized authority that can provide blanket access across regions, for instance. Uh, there's also an acknowledgement that the person in charge of an area and activity has the knowledge of both uh, the needs and the interlocutors to be able to negotiate more effectively that access. And this is why we have this uh, global approach. Okay, thank you for thank you for that, Pilar. Uh, now, Sophie, uh, you are the global access advisor with OCHA. So, could you explain to us how does access sit within OCHA in relation to protection? Over to you, Sophie. Uh, thank you. Actually, I'm very much echoing what Pilar was just mentioning. I mean, for us, like access is an overall responsibility, and we do believe that all OCHA staff have a role to play in terms of like negotiating access or ensuring access through analysis, through advocacy, or through like direct negotiation. But when it comes to headquarters, at headquarter level, IHL protection, protection on civilian and access are in the same section. And the idea was that building and maintaining access and upholding the right and dignity of individuals are both grounded in international law. So the interplay between access and protection was quite obvious. And they are both, you mentioned, imperative. And so we feel like there was like a necessity at global level to make sure that these functions are working together and then supporting the field where everybody has this overall responsibility on access. And of course, I mean, access is also a prerequisite to a lot of like protection programming. So I think it was also like making sense in terms of like ensuring that protection programming can be implemented in the field, that access like work closely um, with uh, this uh, portfolio. Perfect. Thank you so much. And now moving to Maria, as an access advisor in NRC, how does that relate to protection work within NRC? Over to Maria. So for NRC, protection and access is resourced differently um, for each country office. Um, that can be based on the context, um, based on funding opportunity. Of course, it would be great to have an access advisor and protection advisor in every CO. But this is not always the reality. But I think it is important to stress, as um, Sophie and Pilar have both pointed out, is that it is still the role of of everybody. So whether it's protection and protection mainstreaming, whether it's access and access mainstreaming by default, all our area managers, all our um, field field teams really are responsible. It's more about capacity building, designing of tools, supporting, um, so that we can make sure that access really is everybody's job in the field, um, and they are more supported to take on that role. When it comes to uh, protection and access, uh, so we have an NRC kind of three pillars of, of protection, safe programming, which is protection mainstreaming, safe plus, um, which is integrated protection, and then we have standalone programming. Um, and as I kind of mentioned before, I get to interfere across all our, our competencies and our, our specialty areas, and I'm very lucky to be working with a great protection advisor who's on the line here, so I had to throw her that one. But where, where you kind of see some of the bigger overlap is around the inclusion discussions. Um, it's around the equitable access, and then Sophie pointed out, which is also what I wanted to reinforce, is that protection, standalone protection programming often requires a level of acceptance and trust of the community that a general food distribution or you know hygiene promotion doesn't. And so that's where, as access and also with security as an acceptance strategy, we need to make sure that our programming, the way we do things, is going to serve all of our sectors, and protection is often the hardest one to make sure that communities um, really have that level of trust with us. So that's, that's where we work most closely together. Perfect. Thanks so much, Maria. And now continuing around the panel, Jason, how does UNHCR structure the relationship between access and protection in its work? Hi, thanks. I think 
that as a UNHCR staff, the, when you hear the word access, uh, the first, the instinctive response is thinking about access to territory, access to asylum, and uh, that relationship. And the importance to work toward that and how it links to humanitarian access, I think Sophie uh, made a reference earlier on to the increasing politicization of humanitarian action, and uh, that, that includes also uh, access to territory and, and, and access to asylum. And we need to recall, and it's ingrained in, in us, that asylum it has a humanitarian, a civilian, and a peaceful character. And the need and the efforts to maintain that civilian and humanitarian character of asylum uh, are essential to put forward. And if we work toward that, make sure there's a common understanding and that is clear across the board, that is done. One of the objectives uh, of doing that is to enable humanitarian access. Uh, for the purposes of providing international protection, uh, for the purposes of delivering uh, humanitarian assistance. And so that uh, closing that circle of linking and, and ensuring that everyone is aware of, of why someone needs access to territory, uh, the nature of asylum, and that because of that and because it's everyone is assured and we sustain the civilian humanitarian character, that can be used uh, to push through and in the negotiations and in the understanding and common understanding to enable uh, uh, humanitarian access. Okay, thanks, Jason. Last but not least, as we come around the panel, Yassine, you are a protection cluster coordinator. And uh, we know, of course, that there is no access cluster. Uh, so I wonder, how, can, how would you explain the way that your work as protection cluster coordinator relates to access? Over to Yassine. Well, uh, we, we don't have uh, an access cluster, but usually we have an access working group. Like now in Syria, we have in different uh, hub, we have access working group, which is the protection cluster is an active uh, member of the cluster of the access working group, uh, bringing information analysis on the threats, need, uh, and vulnerable population. Uh, our link is mainly, uh, and we are strong about advocacy, advocacy to access to the most difficult population and also to ensure that protection principle are mainstream then the humanitarian intervention, including when it's come to negotiation and uh, in uh, and also uh, access. In, in Syria, it's a little bit difficult where we been back before with the access working group, uh, and unfortunately now it, it, it's become more independent, so only uh, become agency based. While in in other uh, hubs, we still. Uh, very active. So our role is fundamental to ensure advocacy that the access priority to, uh, and negotiation is, is toward the most vulnerable uh, population, and also to keep protection uh, on on the uh, on the agenda for the humanitarian community when it comes to to provision of assistance uh, to ensure. Uh, that there is meaningful access uh, and safe, dignified uh, uh, for the most vulnerable people. And this is our main role on the access. Right, thank you, Yassine. So now I'd like to um, to move to dig a bit deeper into the dilemmas of access and protection. Again, this is a huge topic. We're going to try to address it um, quite efficiently because I see that there are a lot of questions um, specifically related to COVID-19. Uh, so I want to make sure we have enough time for that um, towards the end. Um, but now I'd like to turn, so this will be to Maria, Jason, and Yassin. Um, what uh, what are the main trade-offs um, when negotiating access, especially in terms of protection? Do you have an example uh, of when it was not possible to uh, to have both, to both pursue um, protection objectives and uh, to have access? And in such a situation, how do you prioritize? Um, and any examples would be very welcome on this. Uh, over to Maria first. 
Thanks very much. Well, I think one of the most uh, timely examples is quarantine sites in this is in Yemen and many countries I am assuming around the world right now. Uh, you know, de facto detain or in close proximity to answer that we uh, the importance of those also is whether we respond in those sites or not. And it isn't a zero sum game. I mean, we to try and um, have the best protection outcomes possible while also having access to to these populations. Um, what we need to weigh up, though, is well, one of the main trade offs is are we able to provide essential services um, and Often that can come at the expense of acceptance or longer term access or freedom of movement of that population or the individual agency of that of those people in those sites. Um, in Yemen right now, uh, to answer your question, yes, we are having a go no go situation for every request or every identification of a, of a quarantine site that we might want to respond to. We need to weigh this up with you know the criticality of the service we're providing, our ability to monitor, our ability to mitigate issues around neutrality and uh, maintain distinction of our operations in those sites, the long and short term access impacts. I mean the list goes on what we have to weigh up. And right now we have not responded in one of those sites because we. We have identified that we cannot, um, you know, the criticality of what NFC can offer in that site does not get way up with the protection concerns that we and the, and the principal access concerns that we um, have weighed up. But it is an ongoing discussion, and it's really key that if you do respond in those sites, you constantly monitor and have a period of review, and you have your red lines and you have your triggers to make sure that if you need to exit, you can do so responsibly. And that's also really key. It's not a yes, no, and then you leave it at that. Got it. Thank you so much for that, Maria. Um, turning to Jason, uh, same question. Do you have an example of, uh, uh, of uh, a situation uh, when it was not possible to both pursue uh, protection objectives and uh, successfully negotiate access? Could you share that with us and, and also um, thoughts on prioritization? Over to Jason. Uh, yes, I think uh, Maria touched on a lot of, of what needs to be done. I, I think of examples such as discussions around uh, what we used to call cross-line convoys uh, coming from uh, in Syria, coming from government to non-government controlled areas, uh, colleagues also working in opposition controlled areas there, and also examples I can think of uh, meetings with uh, IDPs, Rohingya IDPs in Myanmar, where uh, essentially you we're not allowed to ask uh, uh, some certain questions or interact your access to individuals to collect information or to uh, monitor or identify any specific issues was significantly curtailed um, and controlled and monitored by state or other officials. The key, as Maria mentioned, is uh, very good preparation beforehand to understand uh, what the limitations and envision what you are going into and what is the likelihood of what happens to assess uh, if you by going what is the value what is the harm so applying the do no harm approach doing a risk assessment am i validating the actions there by my presence will it be used or abused and what are my expectations or objectives by being present and taking uh, whatever information that I can or interventions, what will I be able to do with it in terms of an actual support to individuals um, or will there be a public or private advocacy resulting in some level of policy change or otherwise. And then when the access is finished, when that moment is finished, to come out and to take a full stock of that and apply lessons learned. But it's really about the preparation and understanding before and after, and then being in place, taking advantage as much as possible of your time there if you do decide to go. Got it. Thank you, Jason. And Yassin, same question over to you. Well, there are two, uh, two concerns uh, we are facing, or we have been facing in many operations before. One of them, uh, 
remotely uh, managing a program uh, with potential consequences for effectiveness, quality, accountability, and risk uh, transference to local staff versus continuing in, 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 in suit management, which may expose some category of staff at risk. And this is one of the biggest challenge, challenging we are facing now in the COVID-19 response in Syria, whereas the national colleagues are taking uh, the big part of the response, which is putting uh, um, their safety at risk. Also, we know and we can see there is a lot of uh, concern related to the quality of the programming, uh, reporting and accountability, etc. So what we are trying to do is uh, to be sure, first of all, our priority, our national colleagues are, are protected and safe and they have all uh, equipment they need to protect themselves uh, in this situation and also trying to help them to find uh, new modalities, work modalities to uh, um, minimize the exposure of themselves to the risks and also uh, uh, following up on a daily basis to be sure what they are doing and, and, and to be sure uh, there is effectiveness and quality of their programming and providing them assistance. We are developing a lot of uh, uh, using the technology to develop uh, online training programming to improve their quality in the field. And the second one is, um, so we list, uh, we have less movement in the field, so we are being presented with a demand uh, from authority to accept some degree of control uh, to uh, deliver assistance for some areas and, uh, and deprioritize uh, some activities. Uh, which is we know if we refuse uh, the, uh, of the authority controls or the army group will lead to rejection of all our activities. So uh, we we have to do an internal exercise inside the protection cluster to see what's the priority, uh, what also can be done, and what's the acceptance uh, from the authority. There is an intensive negotiation with the authority. Well, if you want us to provide one, two, three, you also you have to allow us to provide a certain activities. Uh, so it's an ongoing discussion, negotiation, but it's absolutely not easy. Uh, we have to accept uh, some certain uh, demands from the authorities, but at the same time to be sure also uh, our principles, like the humanitarian protection principle, are in our response. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Yasin. And picking up on, on principles, I'd like to turn to Pilar. How do you see the role of humanitarian principles when faced with dilemmas of access and protection? Over to Pilar. Uh, so when it comes to negotiating access, access for humanitarian protection activities, what I've seen many times is that the issue is not one of compromises on humanitarian principles, but mostly the dilemma that many organizations face is not linked to the principal response, but to be able to carry out the protection side of mandates while maintaining access to populations in need. And this is something that Jason has touched on before. So there's a perception of many organizations that the sensitivity of the protection work may compromise access of humanitarian access, uh, access to the field, Hence, sometimes the decisions are made to negotiate access only on the basis of assistance provision, something that is perceived as an incentive for state and non-state armed groups. So while well, this approach may lead at first to some openings, it may also hinder the future ability of humanitarian organizations to conduct work. An experience has shown that trying to enlarge the range of activities that a humanitarian organization uh, offers at a later stage to include uh, protection work uh, it's not only unsuccessful, but also sometimes it's met with distrust by, by both state and, and non-state actors. So um, it does make sense that uh, organizations are seem to be covering up or not being honest about the whole scope of the work they carry out in a given context. Now, having said that, um, one must say that the adherence to humanitarian principle underpins all efforts to establish and maintain humanitarian access. Uh, so when dealing with access constraints related to protection activities, the dilemmas that 
uh, often uh, we face in relation to um, protection relate to the working modalities of humanitarian organizations. And, and my colleagues have also mentioned some of those. Uh, so those, those working modalities sometimes, so the compromises that we have to make um, are really linked to the way in which we carry out the protection work. And that may be, uh, for instance, restriction of access to certain population but not others, inability to speak directly with affected people as it has been said for some context, one of access uh, to populations instead of regular monitoring visits, um, and, and so on. So this means that often humanitarian organizations feel they have to weigh humanitarian principles versus their people interest, creating tension between the short and the long-term goals. And, and often we, we see how the compromises between doing uh, today may hinder the uh, capacity of an organization to operate tomorrow, and therefore the need to remain consistent and preserving everyone's trust. So when the exceptions are being made, and, and uh, Maria spoke to that, we should think that principles should continue to guide the decision making uh, and, and see how we can lessen the potential impact. And it's a little bit of, of the uh, logic behind the principles uh, that helps to draw red lines. So what are the red lines that we shouldn't cross even when we're making exceptions um, and, and, and the later states showing consistency and predictability while always adapting to the situation we have at hand and uh, the context. Now there are certain issues that may affect the perception of humanitarian organizations and the respect of humanitarian principles. Certain protection activities, uh, for instance public advocacy, can uh, be perceived as compromising neutrality, for instance, and therefore having a later impact on access. So that is why also certain organizations such as the ICRC avoid engaging in political or ideological controversies, while at the same time noting that um, not speaking out or not uh, really making clear what are the protection issues publicly may be interpreted as uh, organizations being complicit with um, what's happening in, in certain contexts. And I leave okay. it there. Okay, great. Thank, thank you, Pilar. I'd like to now turn to Sophie. Um, one approach to access negotiations is that you have a phased approach. We've heard a little bit of, about this. Uh, and you lead with things like food assistance, non-food items, etc., and then bring in protection later on. Are there um, concrete examples of this approach working? Uh, or do you have an example of it not working? What are some of the risks of such a phased approach? Over to you, Sophie. Thank you, yes. So as you mentioned, it's like one of the approach. So of course, like when we're doing negotiation, we will start from like a broader like negotiation. We will like reiterate le the legal framework. We'll mention that uh, the, the different authorities have an obligation to allow and facilitate access. And we will try to negotiate access like for all kinds of uh, humanitarian activities, including protection. But the reality on the ground uh, is sometimes different, as we have heard from the different other panelists. So what we're looking at when we're doing a phase approach is really like looking at acceptance. And I think Yasin was really like mentioning uh, this term as, as a key element for like uh, putting in place programs. And acceptance would require to have like this in-depth analysis of uh, the community uh, the local authorities and trying to understand like how we can gain acceptance with the community and what kind of actors have more access than others. We can see in certain contexts that local actors would have more access than international NGOs or UN agencies. So it's really trying to identify who has a comparative advantage with which kind of program to start like negotiating access and trying to like then expand access. And what we have observed is that certain programs are easier to negotiate. And if we are looking at health, if we are looking at like food distribution or NFI, generally like it's an easier entry point to like discuss with the community and to engage in discussion that would lead to like additional programming in uh, in the future. And we've seen that in a, in a lot of contexts. If we are looking at Northwest Southwest Cameroon right now. 
like food distribution would be the entry point to enter into the community and then like uh, you mentioned the actors would be able to stay in the community and then expand their footprint and then like implement other activities. The risk is that uh, like protection programming or protection activity would be like a second thought. So when we're like doing this kind of activities, if, even if we're doing like food distribution, NFI, we're making sure that there is always a protection outcome in these activities. So protection is never like a second thought, it's already embedded in the other kind of activities. And if we're doing like a, um, a food distribution, for example, we're contributing to the safety of livelihoods of the people and contributing to protection outcome. So the idea is really like to make sure that while we are not maybe starting with protection programming, because this would require much more acceptance, much more understanding from the community and the local authorities. We can start with other activity that would be like easier to be accepted by the community and local authorities, but making sure that protection outcomes are always included in these other activities. Got it. Thank you, Sophie. And as a, a quick follow-up, um, just what about including um, mainstreaming protection activities or including some protection activities in the assistance activities that are at the center of access negotiations. Does this work? And again, um, are there any uh, risks that you see with, with this approach? Back to you. Yeah, I think it's it's uh, going back to this idea of like having protection outcome to any kind of activities, and I think that's the way that we are like promoting uh, protection um, when we are like negotiating access in area where it's extremely complicated, extremely challenging because the authorities or the community are a bit reluctant to see like protection activity mainly because of a misunderstanding of what would be like protection programming. So really like the idea is to ensure that we can have like activity that would include a uh, protection outcome. And if we're doing like education activities, there is a child protection outcome. If we're like doing food distribution, this can go together with also like protection activities. And when we're doing needs assessment, we can do like needs assessment for food security and include some protection questions in the questionnaire. So the idea would be really like to make sure that this protection, if not protection programming like as an activity and that the, the purpose of the negotiation would be included in, uh, in the other activities. And we have seen it as like a successful approach to, to protection. That the fact that we are like starting with a program that would be accepted by the community, that there will be a trust in the organization, a trust in the human agent assistance, then we are able to like start this approach on protection. And we can start like already like included some kind of protection activities, some protection questions, some protection focus group discussion as part of other activities. Great. Thank you. And, um um, at this point, uh, so as we've received a lot of questions uh, related specifically to the context of uh, COVID-19 pandemic, I would like to stay with you for one more question, Sophie, as we transition um, to looking at, um, in your case, as you're looking at access globally, what do you see at this stage in terms of the effects of uh, the pandemic on access? Um, some of the highlights. Back to you, Sophie. Um, so if we're looking at uh, COVID-19 and the impact on humanitarian access, I think like we have like two trends. The first one is actually like amplification of existing access constraints. And what we do see is that in all the countries where we already have pre-existing access constraints, these have been amplified by the crisis. So if we had like bureaucratic impediment, the bureaucratic impediment had even like a, a, a more important impact on, on humanitarian access now that we have like the, the pandemic. And I'm sure our colleagues in Syria and Yemen would clearly be able to, to highlight this. So we can see that the pre-existing access constraints like related to conflict or related to sanction, for instance, have been really amplified by uh, the COVID-19 crisis. And then we see like new and emerging access constraints that are related to the public health measures that have been put in place by government. So we can clearly see like the restriction of movement of goods and personnel into the countries uh, because of the flight suspension, because of um, the quarantine, because of the border closure. So there are a lot of challenges about the restriction of movement into the country. And of course, also a lot of restriction of movement within the country. There are some um, public health measures that have been put in place that prevent 
a movement within the country that challenged the movement of humanitarian goods and humanitarian personnel. So that's also like a, another constraint. Uh, we see also like um, a, a growing anti-foreigner sentiment that uh, translates into threat or threat of violence uh, against humanitarian actors that we are monitoring closely because this is unfortunately uh, quite symptomatic of um, a pandemic or like a, an outbreak where we see uh, this violence against humanitarian personnel. So we are like paying attention to that because this would undermine our capacity to respond to to the pandemic. And finally, and probably like the most important is the capacity of the people in need to have access to humanitarian assistance and basic social services uh, because of the new public health measure put in place, because of the stay-at-home orders or because of uh, the new like social distancing measure that really challenged the capacity of humanitarian actors to deliver and the capacity of the population to have access to these services. And this is something that we are like closely monitoring um, because indeed it will be like extremely challenging in the coming months uh, to uh, put in place like protection programming and protection monitoring when movements are significantly restrained. And uh, there will be like a need to rely much more on the community and to like focus much more like on this localization agenda to make sure that we can continue to deliver and people have access to uh, the humanitarian services and protection services that we used to deliver in the past. Right. Thank you so much, Sophie. Uh, we've had a number of questions now coming in um, from Natasha in the U.S., from Safi and others uh, regarding protection monitoring and, and related issues. I'll just read the question from Natasha. She writes, how are protection actors adapting to the complexities and competing needs posed by COVID in terms of provision of protection services and protection monitoring? Which protection related activities are still being conducted while promoting social distancing? Uh, Yassin, if I could turn to you, what is the situation currently looking like in Syria in terms of access and protection activities? And at this point, feel free, um, please do bring in um, current examples really specifically um, related to this new context uh, as we're now uh, several months into the global pandemic. Over to you, Yassine. Well, uh, it's not easy <laughs> looking for the uh, protection uh, cluster response. It's, it's mainly depending on the community center, uh, community-based approach, which is we have, uh, just to give you an example, we have 450 community center, child-friendly space, women-said spaces across Syria. And these centers usually used to provide a lot of protection or multi-protection services. You can imagine that 450 community centers are, the activities in these centers are suspended now. And also one of the biggest activities we used to have is, is the mobile protection, which is we have this over 150 mobile protection team. They are working in hard to reach area in an area where we have a new displacement returnees try to, to understand their protection needs and also humanitarian needs and also do uh, first aid or, or, or quick protection response. It's also that's been suspended but been hold. So we have over six over over sorry over eleven point five million of people uh, being affected directly by the uh, COVID-19 situation in Syria because uh, all our humanitarian or all our movement for the humanitarian community have been stopped because of the restriction of movement for the humanitarian community, etc. But the added value in, in the Syrian context, uh, the remote management context is not new for us. We have been dealing with, with the Syria in a remote context uh, perspective in the last 10 years. So we, we have, uh, we developed in the last these 10 years, we developed a lot of uh, uh, program modalities. We are able to provide uh, assistance uh, uh, through technology. So we are relying a lot lately on, on, um, on uh, social media like WhatsApp group, uh, telephone to do uh, a psychosocial support, individual psychosocial support to identify and refer cases and also to do 
case management at certain level, but also we are developing a lot of standard uh, operation procedure and guidance also to ensure a specific protection issue like protection of data, privacy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. E one of the things being mentioned also before, we are lucky in Syria when it comes to localization. Uh, we have over 120 protection partners in, in, in Syria, and the majority of them are national partners. Therefore, like a lot of activities in, in a hard to reach area, it continue a little bit, like at, at, at partially because our protection partner are working um, in, in deep field area. So for, for the protection cluster now, we, we are transferring knowledge and resources and more uh, uh, doing advocacy to, for our local partner to get more funding to, 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 because they already have access and they can provide uh, better, ac better activities, dignified assistance, better than any other, uh, better than me, better than the foreigner, basically. They, their conference, their context. We also realize, um, uh, that people uh, um, are at the central of the response. They usually know much better than us what the need and how to respond. This is why we are also emphasizing and empowering community members uh, to take more leads uh, and response uh, within their community. We have seen there is a lot of initiatives happening in the last three weeks, like a volunteer going around cleaning the camps, uh, collective shelter, helping elderly to have uh, to see the doctor or to buy a medicine, doing like a safe community inside collective uh, and camps to protect women and children. So we, 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 we basically supporting these initiatives from the communities. But we also giving them more resources like uh, protective material to protect themselves uh, and also providing them a lot of guidance how to ensure uh, uh, the, the, the protection uh, principles. And finally is, um, is we are reaching uh, or we are achieving protection basically through others. Uh, and this is when it comes to ensure uh, that protection are mainstreamed in other sectors where where they have much better access than us, uh, where the authority will allow the wash, health or shelter actors to, to go and provide assistance with no with no objection, where we where the protection activity is deprioritized by authority. So we're trying to achieve these protection activities objective as since we say protection is an objective so we are trying to achieve it through other our uh, other partners to, to, to be sure that assistance is, is is dignified and everybody have access to this assistance where action is not will not harm uh, vulnerable communities and we emphasize a lot in case management, especially there are a lot of protection concerns related to women and children in quarantine and isolation facilities. So we are training, working also together with other uh, partners like health, uh, health and wash colleagues, uh, training uh, the frontline health staff to do first aid psychosocial support uh, and also to identify uh, protection cases need urgent support and they can refer it to us for follow-up to, to, to do a case management and provide support. So this example, what we are doing to overcome uh, the access challenges in Syria right now. Thank you very much, Yassine. Thank you very much. And Maria, if I could turn to you, how about the current situation in Yemen? Over to Maria. Thanks very much. So I guess in Yemen, um, getting the basics right for access this first is absolutely critical. I mean, Yassine talked about earlier new modalities and measures, so how we do general food distribution, how we do hygiene promotion, et cetera, has, has changed. And 
The first thing to make sure we maintain the trust of communities and the trust of authorities, as well as protecting our beneficiaries and our staff to exposure, is to make sure we do those, those keep those COVID measures in place. And this pandemic, we're going to see this for months. We all know that. So maintaining staff training, main, maintaining the communication to communities on on what we do and, and the measures we're taking will be critical to maintaining the trust and also to keep ahead of that anti-NGO um, sentiment that Sophie, Sophie mentioned. Um, if we can make sure that any exceptions or exemptions to operations to be able to continue essential services, we are protecting, um, protecting our reputation, our staff and our beneficiaries. Um, also, monitoring directives that are coming left, right, and centre is, is always a fun job in Yemen, and it's heightened now, um, as Sophie also mentioned. So they're being released by um, also by different factions. Um, that is something to really watch as an access person, because how we're always we're always trying to um, ensure that we don't over empower certain actors, um, that we maintain our links with civilian authorities as the default. Um, and, that, and so making sure, particularly in the south of Yemen right now, where there is a kind of unimplemented peace agreement and, you know, different factions are jumping on this emergency response, as is often the case, to show political will to control resources. And NGOs have to be very careful about how we listen to those directives um, and to monitor the practices, because obviously their, their ability to implement them is different to their ability to uh, announce them and release them. On the access and protection overlay um, explicitly, I think is in Yemen we have to, this is an opportunity, um, we have to watch that we protect protection, basically. I mean, for those of us that have worked in Yemen, we know that um, any protection-related activities, uh, including you know legal services, are hard fought for to be approved. And as we jump on great opportunities for exemptions to allow COVID-related activities without, you know, normal protracted approval processes, we may be jumping on those, being really excited that we can go without a, a project approval um, by a ministry, but also knowing that by reprogramming those lines or by accepting the, the authority's definition of COVID-related, we might be losing the small window or the, the hard-fought opportunity we had for legal services, for child protection, um, for other standalone protection activities. And that is going to be crucial for us to watch um, and to balance how we capitalize on, on those opportunities and how we package protection now during the COVID response as well as as well as post-COVID. But, you know, there are also great opportunities. I mean, we've talked a lot about already today how protection has often taken the most um, trust and community acceptance um, to build, to implement protection programming. And so, therefore, you know, maintaining the community engagement, using um, protection-based uh, community networks to, to do awareness activities, to do rumor management around a pandemic that has a lot of um, conspiracy theories and a lot of unknowns um, and a lot of contradictory information out there. Um, another opportunity is to to look at how are we doing vulnerability mapping and there will be, you know, we know there are specific vulnerabilities to COVID. So how do we use our protection teams and our protection networks to, to update those vulnerability mappings? And how do we mainstream or how do we use our protection teams to work with CCPM teams or with WASH teams to to create ideas and initiatives like these green zones where instead of looking at quarantining sites, we're looking at protecting vulnerable people. So I think there are also lots of opportunities. We just, I don't think we should look at it as let's look at protection, what we need to do in six months time. We Otherwise that window will close for what we can do now and what we can do then. Over to you. Got it. Thanks a lot. And to Jason, if we could hear a bit from you about um, the context where you're working um, in Greece, but in response to the same question, uh, including related to protection monitoring, um, um, but also protection services in, in the current context. Over to you, Jason. Okay. Um, I, I think that you know, a lot of the questions that were coming were how do we learn lessons from the, the past and one of the um, things that we that that I personally used uh, right when the pandemic was announced and uh, all the measures started being put in place and 
you know, Greece is not a complex zone, although uh, there are some difficult, uh, very, very difficult and harrowing situation on the islands where uh, there are, are, are camps and reception centers uh, overcrowded. Um, and a lot of our partners uh, were in, in staff wanted to, you know, follow the instructions, uh, rightly so, and the health instructions, and also wanted to uh, kind of go to their homes and find ways to, to stay away from the work. And the first thing was to learn lessons or draw from the past and to, to say to a very large group that, you know, if we found a way to, to stay and deliver as humanitarians in uh, Ebola epidemic in uh, in West Africa in, in 20, I think it was 2015, or to be able to deliver safely uh, in besieged areas in Syria, then we can find a way to stay and deliver, but in a, a safe in a in a safe way for ourselves and for the persons that we're trying to support. And so that uh, I think learning, just having those experiences and difficult experiences to reflect on, one encourages. Uh, uh, colleagues to to stick around right now what what we have the situation in these um, uh, centers in the Aegean islands we have about a, a total uh, across five camps about 35,000 persons in a space cumulative for 5,000 people so you can imagine that any restrictions when we're announcing to individuals to uh, wash your hands and to social distance when they don't, or to go and seek medical support when there's insufficient water, insufficient hygiene and sanitation, and uh, very complex overcrowding there, this is just not doable and not feasible. And we, along with the humanitarian actors and civil society, have been calling for an urgent decongestion of these camps and bringing the uh, overcrowding to the mainland, and that has been delayed. With the coronavirus, what we, and it's really a protection uh, intervention, is have been able to do is to highlight uh, using our vulnerability analysis and population assessments to identify those who are most at risk of um, developing complications due to coronavirus. So that would be the elderly and um, as well as the immune suppressed. And these persons are already generally on our, on our listing of, of, of what we look out for in terms of uh, humanitarian protection and support. And that population, which them and their families make up almost 10% of the total population, we're now in the process of a, a large-scale evacuation and transfer of the, that population to other locations on islands or onto the mainland. And what that requires is it's not we can't be do, done remotely. Some of it can be done in assessing the data and, and, and uh, arranging for planes and boats and cars for them to go. But so much of it has to be done safely and in place. So what we've done is uh, just a very good, luckily and fortunately, we did a, a pretty good uh, business continuity planning before this and we're able to rely on, the, on that now of knowing what is critical and not, and review essentially every action that we plan that is relates to, to our activities and see what can be done in a safe manner and what can be done uh, uh, in a safe manner face-to-face, -face, what kind of protective, protective equipment is needed for individuals uh, uh, that we're trying to support, as well as our own humanitarian staff, and what um, and what can be done remotely, and what are the drawbacks to that, and, and this is how we're applying it. So we're, a, we, we're able to, let's say, it's, it's obviously to stay and deliver and in a safe manner. There's definitely some efficiency losses, losses but uh, the critical areas, we are able to, to be there in a safe manner uh, in as much as possible. Over. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, just a quick note, we've come to the end of our scheduled time, but uh, thanks to the great generosity of our panelists, we are going to continue for another uh, 10 minutes or so, so we can continue to cover some of the questions that have come in. Um, I hope that you're all able to stay with us, otherwise you will be able to access the recording of the event afterwards. So I'd like to turn next to 
Pilar. So uh, we've heard now from Jason, from others, about this idea of learning from the past. I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, just bring in a, a few questions that we've had from participants um, on this and also some related issues. So we had a question from Anne asking, uh, is, is the new COVID-19 situation really new? Uh, didn't, we, didn't we learn applicable lessons from Ebola? We heard a bit about this from Jason, um, but Pilar would be great to have your reflections as well on how we can learn from the past, especially when it comes to access and protection. And if I could, I will just add on uh, another concept that uh, possibly you can reflect on a bit, Pilar, in your response. And that's related to um, this idea of uh, of the perception that uh, that COVID-19 is brought in by foreigners and how this can play into a kind of negative propaganda associated with humanitarian work and that can really affect um, affect access and uh, affect the um, uh, the protection work of of humanitarian organizations. Um, these are all some related uh, some related issues. The questions coming in from Nirwa in South Sudan, Buntea in Cambodia. Pilar, if I could turn to you for reflections on this idea of learning from the past, perhaps the example of Ebola and this uh, tricky problem of negative perceptions of humanitarian work in such a tricky context. Over to you, Pilar. Thank you. So, yes, we can learn lessons. Um, maybe no, uh, the situation is not the same as in Ebola. I think that the, the scale and scope of the, of the problem uh, and of the pandemic it's very different. And the fact that um, we are actually seeing also a gradual spread and, 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 and the fact that we are not seeing uh, any, I mean, Ebola, we have had this problem before. And there have been situations in which we have been able to control the uh, disease. It's not the, the case right now. So I think there's a, this time is very challenging in the sense that we were not prepared to a situation in which uh, this scale and scope uh, will prevent physical access and, and have potential, and, and that our access actually as humanitarian organizations could have harmful effects on people. And that we have to take uh, into account. And this links also to the fact that there's, uh, the, the fact that the, the, the Western European countries have been affected first, and that many organizations are, are linked to this um, region, um, have a perception in, in different countries of foreigners that are traveling are carrying the disease and that may um, be bringing that to, to the country. So the, the situation in which we're operating, I think it's, it's a slightly different from the one in Ebola. Yet, I think that there's certain things that obviously we can learn from that situation. I think one of the things that is important is not to forget that there's certain legal frameworks that continue to provide, provide crucial safeguards and that we should draw on those um, for for many different uh, protection activities that we may undertake. Um, and that there are many activities that Jason said that could be done even remotely as well, and that we have done that in the past. So I think that protection monitoring uh, is, is still possible in many, in many contexts. We're still receiving information from many contexts. I think that obviously there are certain, uh, the, as it was said before, I mean, if you had problem, access problems uh, before the crisis, these will be amplified. But we have worked uh, constantly, whether with partial access or no access, in many different contexts. And we have adapted to that situation by finding different strategies. Obviously, I think that connection with communities um, is difficult these days, and, and we are trying to find ways in which we can engage with communities to support them. Um, in, this, in this pandemic, it's not going to be possible if we didn't have contacts before. So I think that this, uh, the, the main constraints that we may have to actually reach populations that we haven't had contact before, I think we have constraints regarding the amount of information that, we, that is being circulated. We, have, uh, we are speaking about infodemic. There's a lot of information and misinformation. Trust is a global issue, not only because of the stigma of the disease, but also because no one understands anymore, given the amount of information and contradictory sometimes, how, um, what is the information they should pass. So, so these things we, we have to factor in um, today, and we have to adapt. And I think that, um, yes, 
some of the lessons from Ebola can be uh, applied to this situation, but uh, there are many things that require a new and creative solution. And I think that as we go forward, we are trying to find those solutions, but um, we're still very early on to provide any lessons or any very good practices. Great. Thank you so much, Pilar. And uh, Sophie, could I ask you uh, also to come in on these issues of learning from the past, uh, etc.? Over to you, Sophie. Yes, yeah, sure. So I think the scope and the scale of like the, the pandemic is unprecedented. So it's very hard like to really like look at what has been done in the past and trying to use this uh, to, to respond now. However, if we're looking at certain issues, uh, we see certain issues we have already like seen in other contexts, such as like the Ebola outbreak uh, in West Africa in 2014 or in DRC last year or uh, an ongoing and, uh, and even the cholera outbreak in Yemen. So I think one element that has already been mentioned is really uh, this uh, anti-foreigner sentiment and the management of rumor. So I think like from the very onset of the crisis, there was like a huge effort on risk communication and community engagement to make sure that we can mitigate this uh, from the very beginning and to make sure that we don't reach a situation where humanitarian actors cannot really implement the uh, preparedness of response activity in the context of the COVID-19 because of this anti-foreigner, anti-humanitarian uh, actors uh, sentiment. So I think the management of the rumor is something that was in everybody's mind and that was really like part of uh, the, the first activities that have been put in place. I think what we're also looking at is making sure that any activities or any measures that we agreed on at this stage of the response will not undermine our capacity to have access in the future. And I'm really like much looking at some aspects, for example, in some countries where the militarization of the response has really challenged our capacity as humanitarian actors to continue activity. So if we're looking at DRC, where the use of armed escort um, has been uh, one of the ways to respond to the Ebola outbreak in certain area, this was creating a precedent that the humanitarian community was reluctant to go because they were not considering it as a last result and they were really um, worried about the fact that there is no exit strategy to the use of the armed escort. So I think what we can learn from the past is also making sure that everything that we're doing now will not have consequences on our capacity to continue to have a principal response uh, in the future. What we're also looking at is, uh, especially in the context of the COVID-19, is uh, the closure of schools. And we know like from the past that schools are not only a place where uh, students have access to education, but also a place where people have access to like food security, to child protection. And we know also that the fact that the closure of school like will have ripping effects on children with uh, additional risk of abuse, additional risk of maybe uh, being recruited by armed groups and so on. So I think that's something that we're also like very much looking at, knowing that this has been already the case in areas where schools have been closed, not necessarily because of a public health uh, crisis or not necessarily because of an outbreak, but this is something that we can already like really look at and make sure that we can find some mitigation measure from the very beginning. And I think, uh, as Pilar mentioned, it's very hard right now to really like draw the lessons and trying to identify like best practices because the situation is so fast evolving that humanitarian actors are really like in a very like reactive mode, but at the same time like trying to be proactive, trying to be prepared, trying to look at what has been working in all the contexts and trying to adjust to the situation. But it's something that is like very much evolving, and I think. Like the main recommendation is to ensure that like best practices from one country to another can be shared and that people are using community of practices to make sure that when we see like a good practice, we're trying to like share this experience with other country offices. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we have time for just one more question. This is a question coming in from Samantha. Um, we've mainly uh, been talking about COVID-19 as creating new access constraints, but there are ways. Uh, but are there ways in certain situations in which this can even be an opportunity for extending access? A very interesting question, Samantha. Jason, if I could turn to you for your views on this. Sure. Thanks. Well, I already mentioned the fact that we're doing these 
evacuations of some specific persons. So we're getting some headwind, headwind on, on moving a large number of persons out of the youth camps um, that had been ripe for an outbreak. Uh, they'd had a meningitis outbreak in, in the camps, uh, in one of the camps two weeks before the COVID pandemic. Um, in addition, because of the nature of the virus, that it that, that it doesn't discriminate against uh, uh, anyone, that anyone can be uh, impacted. These are allowing for overcoming some level of, um, let's say, public misunderstanding of, of serving, making the situation better in these centers. Or, and also, uh, it has opened doors for some European solidarity that has been pending for some time. So some examples are in these camps, we are able now to replace and expand a lot of the water, sanitation, and hygiene infrastructure, uh, which had been on hold uh, or held up for a long, long time. So in the name of, of coronavirus, in the name of reducing or doing some prevention work and reducing the exposure, which in the end, these aren't closed camps or they're, 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 uh, they're stay at home and shelter in place. So there's a soft quarantine there now, but they're not closed camps. So any, the exposure there would expose also the locals on the islands. In addition, we have been pushing for many, uh, multiple years now, the, to restart the relocation of individuals uh, that arrive in Greece and the solidarity and burden sharing amongst other European countries. And while this has not picked up yet for a larger uh, number of persons, it did pick up for unaccompanied children. Somehow, uh, uh, the, the, the message of uh, the 5,000 unaccompanied children living in Greece uh, that are asylum seekers and refugees uh, had already been an important measure. But then, because of the coronavirus, because of their conditions, a few member states of Europe decided to uh, pick up and call for, with the civil society really pressuring government actors to do something about this. And now we've uh, made some progress with some relocations that have not occurred for years now within a week's time in order to, quote unquote, save uh, these families and children from this pandemic. We've had relocations to Luxembourg and Germany. And we are hopeful that there will be uh, these will these pilots will turn into large scale opportunities. Great, thank you so much for that, Jason. Um, now we're we're just wrapping things up here. I would like to turn, as promised, to William Chamali with the Global Protection Cluster. Um, I hope you're still on the line with us, William. Even though that we're running a bit late, it would be great to hear from you briefly. Um, just your reflections on on this discussion of the last hour and a half. What what were some of the key points that stood out to you? Over to you, William. Thanks a lot, uh, Anhar, uh, and thanks uh, for BHAP, for NNRC, for, for this great uh, discussion, and quite timely. I would like to acknowledge the vibrant uh, discussion by the, by the participants uh, in the chat box and the sharing of tools uh, and, uh, and reports uh, as well. I think it's, uh, it's great to see uh, the, the cross uh, communication across uh, the sound, uh, what we're presenting in the panel and, uh, and the sideline. Uh, that's, uh, that's great. Uh, I think the, the conversation uh, feeds straight into some key challenges we're facing in the national protection clusters, and I think Yassine highlighted many of them, but also in the global protection cluster and uh, colleagues from OCHA and Pilar uh, and others who are on the advisory group of the GPC were, were it's a real time wrestling uh, with these uh, challenges. Uh, I have uh, four points uh, that, uh, that stood up for me. I, I think first, uh, highlighting the point from, from Maria and Sophie that access is not only about us getting services to people, but people getting to services, uh, especially in cases not through us at all, from people to people and through local communities and organizations. I think that's 
an important uh, reminder, an important fact, an extremely timely, uh, timely notion in the time of, uh, of COVID. Uh, that I would like to reiterate, but also to say that uh, the notion from uh, uh, from Jason as well as Sophie that uh, we look at we think of access as a geographic uh, issue and uh, and of course uh, the measures taken for COVID have severe impact on on physical access, but also when we do have access to communities, are we able to access the most vulnerable people and uh, and uh, it's in this uh, context with COVID just another layer of, of, uh, of challenging us to access uh, from a protection perspective the individuals and the communities that need most uh, presence uh, from uh, from a humanitarian side. This, so the second point is that uh, that came across very clearly that uh, Accessing for complex protection issues is harder than accessing for concrete material aid. Uh, and that's true. Complex protection issues require trust with the community, built-in impartiality, etc. And it was great to hear from all the uh, speakers, uh, especially Pilar and Yassin. Um, kind of four guiding uh, questions we have to ask ourselves when we're negotiating these access. So first, is it a good deal for the community we're trying to serve? And second, we we need to weigh in what to mitigate uh, in the process of ne negotiation and compromise. But then third and fourth, I think, are really powerful thoughts. First, the third element that came across is what's the longer term of the decisions and the compromises that we're making now? And the fourth is, how is my compromise as one organization affecting access of other organizations? And I think in, in a space like COVID-19, when we have uh, sometimes competition between organizations to access, the tendency sometimes to compromise is easier. And if we're guided by not our agency's access, but the wider access as a, as a, as a guiding principle. Uh, I think we make sounder decisions that can last for, uh, for longer. The third point uh, that stood up is, uh, is, I guess, some of the thoughts re specifically related to COVID uh, response. Uh, and here, uh, a number of, uh, of maybe uh, guidance for us uh, in the field uh, came out uh, that are important. First is uh, localization and communication with community and working with networks has always been on our radar, uh, especially strengthened through through the grand bargain and, and the whole process there. But now we're, we're in reality, seeing that uh, operations like Yassine mentioned and, uh, and Pilar, uh, partners that have invested in networks and uh, organizations who have a presence in their communities are the ones who are able to, to adapt their programs, uh, the individual case management, uh, to be run remotely and through these communities. So I'm wondering if, if this is, I mean, this is clearly the most important currency for, for protection delivery and service delivery is our network on the ground. Uh, communication with community has been professionalized over the last years with OCHA and, uh, and partners like UNICEF and UNHCR and ICRC through the IFRC network. I think we need to move, we take it uh, to a next layer. We need to learn from what's happening and invest in really building up national protection networks that are able uh, to continue delivering in contexts like this. And I think now is the right momentum and time uh, to shape uh, shape this uh, going forward. Uh, and finally, for protection access in COVID-19, I really value the input uh, uh, from uh, Sophie, uh, uh, Pilar and Maria, that uh, delivering protection is a phased process. Delivering food is already protection delivery, uh, but in, in a staged approach. And I think the more we can build in this logic of 
incrementally using our access to tackle the hardest issues to, to deal with uh, of protection nature, uh, the, the best uh, possibilities we have to do so. So instead of protection actors uh, seeking access, I think only, I think building up networks with partners who have access and maybe not do not have protection expertise to evolve their programs in, in this direction. Uh, and finally, I would like to to uh, to close with uh, uh, Pilar reminding us of the importance of international humanitarian law. We have a rock. We have to remind everyone that this rock exists and not forget it, because this is a steady uh, space. And uh, when we're faced uh, with challenges of access and challenges uh, of the nature of uh, COVID protection principles as well. Are another rock uh, to uh, to to lean on, uh, and uh, as Jason said, we have to prepare well, uh, react during the process, and learn after it. And I think that's a, a simple logic that uh, also applies in this context. I close here, Anharad, and over back to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, William. That was tremendously helpful, and we very much appreciate uh, your being here and also uh, the support of yourself and, and other colleagues within the GPC for making this event possible. So thanks so much. Um, now uh, we're going to go uh, very quickly right around this virtual table here to um, the rest of our, our panelists for for their brief closing remarks. Uh, we'll turn first to Pilar, if you're still on the line. Pilar, over to you. Thank you so much. Just maybe to, to remind everyone that it's a health crisis now, but um, we, as with any humanitarian crisis, it can very quickly turn into a protection one. Uh, in many countries, there is already uh, a crisis ongoing, and this superposes to the situation uh, on the ground. So. Let's not forget that um, the protection aspect of the response, access negotiations should include the capacity of humanitarian access, actors to wait on the impact, for instance, of, of measures being taken today by, by the different states on COVID-19 uh, situation, while also acknowledging the difficulties of many authorities to respond to this situation and the fact that we as humanitarian actors have to see how best frame uh, or response to also support them in this in this endeavor because um, we've heard a lot about the handicaps and, and, and the constraints being put forward, but I think that this situation has also opened up um, uh, a lot of uh, requests for us uh, for, for guidance on the side of, of different authorities. Thank you. Thanks, Pilar, and thanks so much for taking the time to um, work with us today on this discussion. Very much appreciated. Uh, now to Yassine, if we could turn to you for your final thoughts. Yes, so just remind ourselves that protection is fundamentally about people. Uh, they know their needs, they know how to protect themselves, and this is why we have to do what, why we have to empower them, especially now in, in, in the COVID context where we don't have access. So we need to do whatever to do to, to empower these communities, provide them with whatever they need to improve their capacities, skills, resources to be able to respond to the needs of their community. And also to, to remind everybody that protection is not one organization responsibility. All the humanitarian agencies have responsibility and are accountable to ensure that people are safe from harm. So this is why we cannot be the protection partner or agency just advocating for uh, protection and also ensuring that protection in the uh, first item, the agenda, uh, because there's a lot of conflicting uh, uh, in the agenda of the access. So protection has to be there, and we all have to push for that uh, to ensure that the most vulnerable is, um, is served. And it's also to, just to, to, to confirm that, yes, it's a health public uh, problem issue, but also uh, we are there because we are there to respond to the needs of the affected population, the, the people who are already vulnerable. So let's not, and this is my concern, what how I see some response in the field, everything is about health. But 
and and we are uh, in somehow forgetting about the most vulnerable who will become more and more and more vulnerable so they have to be at the heart of our response uh, in the in covid response and thank you very much for having me Thank you, Yassine. Thanks for your for your insights today, sharing your experiences, and all the best uh, with your work uh, in the Syria context. I'd like to turn now to Maria for your brief closing comments. Thanks very much. I mean, it's so hard to choose what to say, but I think that to be very concrete, um, what I would like to share is to use COVID as a catalyst. You know, let's do the simple things better. Um, community acceptance being the one area I'd like to flag and community engagement. I mean, from an access point of view, we are going to lose some type of presence, whether it's shifting operations to focus on particular geographic areas or particular sectors or uh, a complete reduction in presence in the field. The communities we work with are going to see changes and we really need to use this opportunity to create community engagement systems or reinforce what we have existing. Um, we need to make sure we're proactive and transparent about what they can expect from us now and also you know, in the near future as much as we can predict but maintain expectations. And this will be absolutely crucial to not only identifying programmatic responses and, and things that we can do throughout the response, maybe you know, negotiating for ad hoc one-off um, trips to the field to fix things, but also it will be crucial to scaling back up. But they need to know that we are not going anywhere. Um, and that is something that I think we all need to use COVID to put that in place or reinforce it and then not forget it, not drop the ball afterwards. Let's maintain that. Terrific. Thank you, Maria. Thanks for um, also taking the time to, to share with us today and all the best with your work. I'm turning to Jason now for your brief closing comments. Sure. And that would be to just uh, as we are, I think, trying to keep an eye on the post-COVID uh, situation. And while we should take advantage of and think of how we can take the positives forward and sustain them, also think about the systems that we are adapting and making work so that they can work in a more restrictive environment and being ready to, uh, let's say, unwind those where they are could be problematic and could encourage a more restrictive environment for the future. Our, the High Commissioner for Refugees just uh, sent out a press release today that 167 countries have uh, partially or fully uh, closed their borders, and 57 are not countries are not making uh, an opportunity available for those seeking asylum. So we are monitoring locally, and each of us should, what we are doing to, to make sure that we can go back, uh, build upon the good, and, and, and go back to, to normal and not let make things permanent where they shouldn't be. Thanks. Very important point. Thank you, Jason, and thanks to you also for your time today. Last but certainly not least, Sophie, back to you for your brief closing comments. Thank you. So I think today we've clearly seen that protection and access are a shared responsibility. So I think I would just like to reiterate the need to work together to achieve collective humanitarian outcomes while ensuring the respect for the rights and dignity of individuals. And I think this is crucial if you want to answer like to the COVID-19 outbreak in an efficient and principled manner and keeping in mind that we are there like for the community, for the people, and that our primary objective is to respond to their needs. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Terrific to have you with us. Um, that's it for our event today. I really appreciate everyone who was able to stay. It turned out to be uh, about half an hour longer than expected, but there was so much to discuss. Um, as I mentioned, we will have a recording of today's event, both in video and audio-only podcast format. That will be available on the event page in the coming days. Also, as mentioned, we'll be continuing this discussion 
participation in the online community, including posting speakers' responses to some of the questions that we didn't get to address live in the event. So that will be a great opportunity, hopefully, for all of you to carry forward this important discussion. Those of you who already indicated in your registration for today's event that you were interested in hearing more from PHAP, you should have already received an email uh, with access to the community uh, with your login link. Um, if you did not receive an account but you're interested in, in being part of the conversation on the community, you can just contact us uh, at PHAP and we'll be happy to send you the login details. Um, finally, as mentioned, there will be several more webinars in this series in collaboration with NRC on access and protection. There will be more information about that coming out soon. And uh, yeah, in which, uh, among other things, and those events will be getting into additional practical questions regarding access and protection in the context of the COVID pandemic. So I know there were a number of questions uh, that we want to dig deeper into regarding the current context, and we'll be able to do that uh, in this series of the next upcoming three events with NRC. So with that, a big thank you to everyone, both panelists and participants, for a very interesting discussion, as well as to NRC. RC colleagues and the PHAP team working behind the scenes to make this all possible. Also to thank again the GPC, Global Protection Cluster, for their support as well as the financial support from USAID. Thanks everyone. This is Anherid Lang signing off from Geneva.